Yes. Uh, so and uh, uh, today and uh, we are representing the Beijing the Mirror uh, News. Yes. And so this is uh, we can say the biggest uh, news network and in overseas, mm. and but we have an um, audience uh, all over the world, mm. and including the English uh, mm. program. Mm. So uh, it's a great honor and, uh, for us and to have you and uh, grant us uh, this Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so we have the uh, first question. Okay, Mr. Uh, before I arrived over here, I've, when we talk about Dr. Sangate, a lot of people, they rave about your impeccable credentials, mm. and they, they say that you combine modern sensibility with the traditional Tibetan culture. How does your background help with the democratic government here in Dar Darmsal? Um, well, I was born and brought up in a refugee camp. So from a humble background, so I went to Tibet refugee school. So from my childhood on, uh, through the school, the Tibetan culture, you know, Tibetan sense of identity, is very much inculcated and uh, you know embedded in me as a Tibetan. Uh, then obviously I went to study Delhi University. Then I went to study in the U.S. where I spent 16 years. So I think it's just the combination of my experience and upbringing combines both the Tibetan identity and the traditional mindset and upbringing with the modern education as modern as. Delhi University and Harvard Law School can provide. So I think it's a combination of both, you know. So uh, even though when I was there in the US for 16 years, it's very tempting uh, to submit yourself to the melting pot. Uh, so, but I was always uh, active on Tibetan cause and Tibetan movement. And there was a small community in Tibet in, uh, in Boston. So as much as I became a diehard fan of Red Sox, baseball and you know New England Patriots football I remain in my heart and mind a true Tibetan so hence you combine the both so when I took the responsibilities here so this is the establishment this is as conservative as Tibetan as one can get and uh, hence you know so you bring something new what you have learned but you have to respect the sensibilities uh, and also the uh, traditional uh, values and ethics as well. So hence, you know, there was adjustment period, but because I, I can tap on both the tradition and modernity, you know, and Tibetan sensibility and American culture and mindset. So, you know, uh, I can adapt uh, maybe much easily uh, than a person with a completely one set of background. So maybe Long answer, but uh, that's how it is. Yeah. That's great. What prompts you to uh, run for election here? Because you lived, you said you lived in the U.S. for quite a long time, and you studied Harvard, and you have, you have the JSD. Uh, yes. And uh, so, what prompts you to to enter politics here and move out here? Yes. Yeah, so, as the Solomonist talks about, you know, uh, materialism, modernism and traditionalism, you see, and element of compassion. So the whole uh, uh, philosophy in this world is a choice between Darwinian survival of the fittest uh, and a self-centered, selfish-oriented, individual-oriented mindset or selfless, compassion, communitarian, egalitarian Buddhist mindset, right? So you have to choose between the two. So from a material point of view, and I think I should not be leaving America or my job at Harvard Law School because you know, it fulfills all the things that you need the modern world and material world provides you. you know? um, but I left uh, and here I'm working for a little more than $400 a month, but still I'm happy and content, mainly because I'm combining or fulfilling the Tibetan values and the you know uh, and the ethos, uh, that's being you know selfless. Uh, you're working for others. There's in Tibetan school the slogan or the uh, theme is others before self. So normally you're always taught in modern education self before others, right? I am most important. But here we are told not I, but we as humanity, we as Tibetan people are more important. 
So I chose others before self to the extent I could. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Huh? So hence, I left America my job, material world, and I'm fulfilling the spiritual world, the Tibetan traditional uh, values, but most importantly, Tibetan cause. Because you know, when you grow up uh, in your families, when you hear my parents' sufferings and the tragedy that they underwent, and the sufferings and the tragedy and the pains of Tibetans in Tibet even now, you, know, you just feel you have to do something. And our teachers and the staff members you know, in our schools, they have always encouraged us elders to serve. So I'm just you know, uh, fulfilling their call, call of my parents and call of elders. Let me ask one question. Excuse, excuse me. Wes, so just can give us a little bit of how it operates. Shall we start? Yeah, please. Before I came over here, I had very little knowledge of the exiled government here, but I've learned a lot during the past several days. And how is our democratic elected government here different from the Western governments, like even though it's a, a government exile, but uh, I noticed that uh, it seems to operate on the basic democratic principles. How different or how same it is, to, if you could elaborate on that for us. It is exactly the same as far as function and the process is concerned. <coughs> but it's fundamentally different from the very principle of democracy. Because when you say democracy, you know, Robert Dahl and all the experts in democracy say there has to be a state. No state, no democracy. Now, ours is stateless democracy. This is democracy without borders. Right. And number two, uh, you know, this democracy does not have in the opposition party. This is a party list democracy. The idea being that if there is a party, political party, political party more often than not fight for its party's interests over national interests. So we want national interests to be the dominant you know, cause. Hence, because it's party list democracy, my position is elected by Tibetans around the world. But in the first round, anybody can run. Anybody can vote for anybody because we don't have party nominees. Right. And then once I'm elected, I represent the people because though all my supporters will dissolve because there's no institutional mechanism or organization that can claim to have supported me. So individuals support me, individuals dissolve after, they, after I get elected. Similar members of parliament also. They get elected individually. After the election, they are not beholden to any organization or any party. They're individuals. So when we have the parliamentary session, executive and the members of parliament, our discourse are issue-based. So if one issue we propose is liked, then two-thirds of members of parliament like it, they support. If they don't like it, then others will oppose. And then when another issue comes, this two-thirds might not support, but other one-third will join one-third and support. So hence, this is very demo, uh, democratic. So in, 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 in true sense, this is very, very democratic or the original or the classic democracy or definite democracy fulfilled. Also, the three pillars are actually three pillars. The American presidential system, if the presidential party, the president party controls the Congress, then even though we say three pillars, but actually two pillars. But in parliamentary system, it's always two pillars because majority are in the parliament and the majority elects the prime minister so has executed the parliament the same here it will always remain three pillars because the members of parliament are elected differently my position is elected differently but because i don't have a party nor the parliament has party no one comes from one party hence it's issue based so it's very democratic and also the election process uh, is also very democratic but as I said, you know, uh, you know, it's fundamentally contradictory because it's, it's democracy without state, it's democracy without borders. That's number one. And uh, you know, uh, number two is also you are not uh, beholden to any individual uh, or organization. And most importantly, uh, among the 60 million diaspora refugees, this is the most democratic uh, setup that you can ever find. And as I, you know, uh, as I say, our uh, Auditor General Office is the most powerful office. 
So even though I have a title of president, but when I fly, I fly economy class because this is the most frugally run administration. Even today, my ministers, they take bus to travel from Dharamsala to Delhi. Now, which uh, government uh, will have a minister traveling by public bus to, to, to cover long distance you know, from Dharamsala to Delhi? So even when I travel abroad, first thing that I worry when I, la when I get in the plane is not my luggage, but my boarding card. Because if I don't have boarding card, I don't get reimbursed. So with four hundred fifty dollars a month, if I don't get reimbursed of one thousand, two thousand dollars, that's three or four, uh, you know, months of my salary. But again, the auditor general or our administration, we don't have police or police station or prison. If I don't have boarding card, I would be put in prison. But only thing is, I'll get a note, small note from auditor general that you did not give your boarding card, and we are very, very scared of that note. Because why? This is a value-based administration. This is a trust-based administration. Hence, you come here to work not for salary, not for promotion, not for courts, not for bonus. If you want all this, you go somewhere else. You come here for service. So this is a labor of love. So hence, this is you know uh, a parallel value-based, in some ways, beautifully and efficiently run administration that you know other uh, countries can also emulate in practice and i was told that the funding from foreign different uh, mm -hmm. uh, sources and they used to support projects only mm -hmm. and the, the ministry of cause here um done by other sources or something yes. is that true that's true um, because the, you know major uh, foundations and philanthropic organizations are also hesitant to fund us mainly because they want to have office in China and they want to have branches in China. So our contribution comes mainly from individuals and small organizations, some governments also. But they are mainly project-oriented. If you want to have school or hospitals, that's how. It. Our administrative cost comes mainly from Tibetan contribution. So every Tibetan has to contribute what we call, uh, it's an oxymoron, but freedom voluntary tax. It's a freedom tax, but it's voluntary, you know. Um, again, interestingly, if you want to vote, you have to pay your freedom tax. If you don't pay your freedom tax, you don't get to vote. So our system is the only one where you have to pay to vote. And the people participation from 2001, 2006, 2011, 2016, in four rounds of election, uh, people who are participating in election has almost doubled. Meaning more people are paying the freedom tax so that they can vote. So in other democracies, the problem is voting is free. You don't have to pay even a penny. But the number of participants are decreasing, right? Even in mature democracy, America, some of the oldest democracies. Whereas ours is increasing and they're paying more. So hence, you know, you can clearly see this is a labor of love. This is a cause because, because we all work for a cause. And the participation and the energy and the dynamism of this small but nonetheless frugally efficiently run administration is you know it's quite beautiful. Great, thank you. Yeah, now we have a uh, little time. I have a lot of questions, but I want to ask uh, basically two. Uh, the, uh, the first question is uh, now we have uh, been uh, talking about the. Uh, um, uh, future for reincarnation and, and for uh, his own and, uh, and so and I know and because in the, the um, uh, um, whole uh, political process uh, there are a term limit for a uh, second mm -hmm. and so this is your uh, second uh, um, um, term mm -hmm. and uh, so it means and uh, after this term you must you see, and, uh, leave the um, uh, population and uh, so and now we are talking about uh, for the Tibetan community exile so we have uh, two leadership uh, and issues we have to think mm -hmm. about. So what, what uh, uh, have you um, done here and because to uh, ensure uh, the confidence and also the, the stability for this kind of arrangement and by involving some type of issue? Uh, my position is very simple because there's two terms limit, that's constitution. And uh, Tibetan people will vote like any democracy system and elect the next seat. So there's a process in place. As far as the Solonist Dalai Lama's reincarnation is concerned, 
I think we know we all uh, <coughs> see him is very healthy and he will live very long. So I'm sure he will outlive many of the Chinese uh, leaders as well. And, uh, he has outlived most of them. He's going to outlive some of the present Chinese leaders as well. Um, but he has said it very clearly in 2011 that you know, the next reincarnation will come in the form of reincarnation, selection or emanation. So reincarnation when one has to pass away, an infant will be born and selected. And the selection is all the high lamas you meet and select the next Dalai Lama. Third is emanation, the present Dalai Lama could designate his own successor. So the plan is there. So process will start. So discussion will start. Uh, so already there's discussion in the community. So in that sense, I think it's pretty clear that the next Dalai Lama will be determined only by this Dalai Lama. The Chinese government or the Communist Party, which believes in atheism, atheism has no role to play. Because, I mean, it's just common sense, right? If you have to choose who your next incarnation will be, then you should choose, right? No one else. And uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party has a track record of destroying 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nuns. 99% of monks and nuns were destroyed. They destroyed Buddhism in Tibet. Even now, as we speak, Larangar Monastery was destroyed. And Yachinagar is in the process of destruction. Now, the photograph of His Holiness Dalai Lama is banned. They call him a devil incarnate, right? So they call him all the bad names. So the Chinese government has no role, should not have any interest in the next Dalai Lama, but they are showing interest, right? So with zero credibility on the part of the Communist Party of China, it is for His Holiness Dalai Lama to decide and for the Tibetan people to appeal the next Dalai Lama come back. And he is the 14th Dalai Lama and there will be 15th Dalai Lama. I want to uh, ask another question uh, because uh, I think I uh, was fortunate enough and to say you work with your daughter. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is my first time to say and you work with your daughter because I also have a, a daughter now in college, mm -hmm. a, a, a older than her. So and I want to ask you and the father. So how and, and, and have you uh, answered the question to her? She's going to ask. Maybe I miss America. I I, I want to go back. Or how can you convince her? Uh, what, what combination do you have? I know, yes. It was a gradual transition. She was born and brought up in Boston. Yes. So, so I brought her once at uh, my inauguration. Then after two years, she came back again. Then we had a good chat, you know, with mother included. So I said, no, you are Tibetan <coughs> and you should know who you are, to know who you are, you must learn Tibetan language, Tibetan culture, Tibetan values, things like that. And also, you know, your dad is alone here, he's quite feeling quite lonely, so I want to have daughter and mother join me. So it's been two and a half years, you know, uh, a little more than that, they've been here. So now she goes to Tibetan school. So she was born in America, studied in all American English school, then she moved here, and in our Tibetan school, up to primary school, everything is taught in Tibetan language, not a word of English. So she had to adjust. But because we had good chat and we made some easy transition, so she, now she is learning everything in Tibetan, science, mathematics, social studies, everything in Tibetan. And in two and a half years, she has done quite well, actually. Uh, she is among the top four or five in the class, you know. So she has made good transition. So even though they are young, you can really talk to them like mature adults and you know, uh, make, uh, make sense. Uh, she know how to play uh, Tibetan guitar, Tibetan flute, Tibetan lynching. Uh, she also performed at national event. We have some national ceremony. So she joined a Tibetan school performance group and she danced uh, also. So you know, as a father, I'm quite happy because I know before I die, if I tell my daughter, you know, you will pray for me, I pretty much know she will know how to read Tibetan prayer book and pray for me. And I will also know that my daughter will be able to teach Tibetan language, Tibetan culture, Tibetan values to her children. So that way, as a father and a Tibetan, I've done my duty to groom her as a as true Tibetan as one can be. Yeah.
And so she's quite supportive. But I've not taken her back to America in the last two and a half years because she might start, you know, really liking America and stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have a last uh, small question because you mentioned the importance of uh, Chinese language and for uh, and some government officials. And uh, I uh, remember when Lee Kuan Yew and he was the prime minister, he could not speak Mandarin Chinese, mm. so he learned. Mm. And then his son, uh, Li Xianlong, could not speak uh, mm. Mandarin Chinese. And uh, so uh, Li Xianlong learned. So I just want to ask you, and because uh, uh, you are going to be uh, really uh, dealing with uh, Chinese, do you think you are going to start some Chinese, some you can speak Chinese? You know, I learned when I was in Delhi University mm -hmm. and also at Harvard, mm -hmm. especially Harvard summer school, I took the intense Chinese language course, two and a half hours, three hours a day. So I learned. But then after I learned for two and a half months, intense course, I could speak and read, write, I don't know, around 750 or 1000 characters. But after that, I was supposed to go to Taiwan and practice. Instead, I land up coming to Delhi. <laughs> Then when you, can, when you don't continue, you forget, no? And also I had a psychological barrier in learning Chinese language. Because, and, uh, you know, in the language instruction courses, they always say, ask you, Ni shi tung go ren, tau mai go ren. I had to always raise my hand, wo pu shi mai go ren, wo pu shi tung go ren, wo shi shi zang ren, you know? And then examples are, the, uh, the men, uh, Beijing shoot to New York shoot. I said, whoa, I mean, how is that shoot? You see, so I was, so I had to, you know, a lot of obstacles that I had to come. I was the odd student in the class, in the class, you know. So, of course, I tried to learn as much as possible, but I did learn something, but then I could not use. So, yes, so I know my putung hua is mama hu hu. Yeah, but, but I, I think you just spoke in, in Mandarin Chinese. I'm sure a lot of our Viewers are going to appreciate. Or uh, can you uh, use Putonghua? Uh, uh, say or uh, say the, uh, the something a message sent to the Chinese. In Putonghua? Yeah. Not much. Ni hao. Woman loves us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you are serving your second term right now. So, what do you consider to be your priorities during the next four years? The number one priority in my first term and second term uh, was and is is, you know, how to solve the issue of Tibet peacefully. Now, based on middle way approach, which was envisioned by His Holiness Dalai Lama, which is to say that, you know, Tibet is under occupation and there is repression. Now, but the Chinese government says that you cannot split the motherland, you cannot separate Tibet from China, uh, and then you have to live within China. So we say, okay. So we will not split the motherland and seek separation from China, but rather we will live within China as long as Tibetans are guaranteed or granted genuine autonomy as per Chinese laws. So that way we are coming to the middle ground. Not separation, not repression. We're coming to genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people. Now, why this is a middle way, why this is reasonable is our policy and our values and stand are not against Chinese people, nor against China as a country. We have tremendous respect for Chinese people. And throughout history, we have lived side by side. Sometimes we have problems. Most of the time, we live peacefully, coexisting very peacefully. So we have to revive that spirit of coexistence and peace that we shared for generations. Hence, middle way approach, genuine autonomy is a moderate, reasonable policy. So sometimes when you give speeches, or sometimes you know, when we stand and do something, it might uh, sound harsh, it might sound very anti, but our policies has never been anti-China or anti-Chinese people. That's where middle way policy is a very reasonable policy. And what we seek is that envoys of the Dalai Lama talk to the Chinese representative and solve the issue of Tibet peacefully based on mutual interests and mutual respect. So that's the number one priority because I'm in exile, but our priority is six million Tibetans inside Tibet. And Tibet is our number one priority. Thank you. That was a good question, yeah.